Hello, everyone, and welcome to GI Live Online. My name is Chris. I run GamesIndustry.biz, and our opening keynote session is with the leader of one of the biggest games companies in the world, responsible for some of, if not the most successful console, PC, and mobile games. So I'm delighted to welcome Strauss Zelnick, the CEO of Take Two. Hi, Strauss. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. It's a it's a privilege and, to ple and pleasure to have you with us. Um, I sort of uh, talked to you up there, but as one of the leaders of the games industry, uh, there are a lot of questions I'd like to ask you, but I thought I'd begin with, and it's quite a broad one, with how you're feeling about the interactive entertainment market at the moment. Uh, there remains a significant console shortage, as we know. There's been continued uh, political, cultural, and now economic unrest, uh, the ongoing uh, challenges around COVID too. So considering all of that, how are you feeling about, about the games market at the moment? Well, I mean, when you put it in that context, it, it feels a little um, narrow to talk only about it, the entertainment business. However, in, with that context as a background, the business is quite strong. Uh, I, I think I was asked often during the, the heat of the pandemic, how did I feel demand would evolve over time? And what I said is what we're finding today, which is, Today, demand as we're receding from the pandemic, one hopes, um, the, the business is stronger than it was pre-pandemic and it isn't as strong as it was when people were, everyone was at home, sheltering at home, um, consuming a whole lot of entertainment. So we've reached a new level uh, that is higher than the prior level before the pandemic. And I think that's the new normal and we'll grow from here. It's a great business. It's the fastest growing part of the entertainment industry. Um, it's dynamic. And I believe that will continue because there are more people entering the market, um, more consumers as, as the business continues to grow. You know, people consume for the rest of their lives that which uh, the entertainment they fell in love with at the age of 17. And the business is about 35, 40 years old, uh, as we understand it today. Mm. So an average gamer, console gamer today is 37, that skews more male than female. Um, there's obviously plenty of room for growth in the cohort because when you turn 38, you don't stop enjoying interactive entertainment. You still enjoy it. It's still your entertainment of choice. Oh, wow. Well, I'm, I'm, that's, that's exactly my age. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I get to keep so, you. So, you know, for a fact, if this is true. Yeah. Well, I, I guess that's the, that's the thing a lot of games companies are doing at the moment is trying to, um, uh, is yes, we're seeing a, a drop from the pandemic peak, which is understandable. Um, but it's now about ensuring that the new customers we may have won over, or that increased engagement sort of is is at a level above where we were. One of the things that obviously is going on in the games market at the moment, and the pandemic might have fueled it a little bit, is the sort of consolidation that's happening in the industry right now. Um, I, I, Take Two has been involved in that, including the, the news uh, uh, that you've completed Zynga. But are we, at a, are we at a stage where small companies might be concerned or should be concerned about the level of consolidation that's going on? I'm not sure uh, they should. I think that you do need to have sufficient resources to field a competitive team and you need the resources to market and distribute your properties. If you're big enough to have those uh, financial resources and the human resources that come along with them, you're fine. If you're too small um, to actually make a game that's competitive or market that game and take the risk of failure that inevitably comes along with this business, then that would be a problem in terms of survival. Uh, but I still think there's enough, enough growth to be had in this business. There's room for small independent studios. And in fact, we part of our company private division is in business with small independent studios or some that aren't so small uh where a lot of great and exciting work is being done mm. a lot of the in, a lot of the innovation happens in the indie space absolutely one of the topics that's coming up during uh, uh this event has been around the metaverse and you've expressed some skepticism about the metaverse buzzword at least in the past but is there any is there any merit to, to some of it do you think I'm always skeptical about buzzwords because they mean different things to different people and uh, people investing behind buzzwords, you know, probably don't end up having uh, great results. Uh, I'm not skeptical at all about huge, interactive, dynamic, entertaining worlds because our company is responsible for housing minimally three of them. Uh, the biggest on earth, Grand Theft Auto Online, then Red Dead Redemption Online, and then NBA 2K Online, um, and others, and others to come. So I'm a dyed-in-the-wool believer 
that people will go to digital worlds to be entertained. And if you offer a super entertaining experience, I think people will flock to it. I think where my skepticism lives is every company suddenly believing that by saying the word metaverse, uh, you know, adjacent to their company's um, uh, business strategy, that that means that somehow they'll be transformed and Nirvana is around the corner. And naturally, that's not the case. Um, entertaining people is really hard. Building hit properties is incredibly hard. It costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. And there's a massive amount of risk attached to it. So when a company that didn't exist two years ago um, launches with a white paper, um, a uh, blockchain-based metaverse and sells hundreds of millions of dollars of digital real estate in a two-day period, um, Sure, I'm a little skeptical because I have a healthy respect for how hard it is to entertain people within that real estate. And in the absence of giving people a reason to visit, I don't, I don't know why the real estate has any value. And that seems to have been lost in the shuffle. But of course, ultimately, all speculations end. The question is not whether, the question is when. And when lots of money is being thrown at a word, and there is some of that happening, you know, you, you can probably guess how it's going to end for a lot of people. And I think the answer is not well. Well, you mentioned new companies that are starting up, but we're also seeing a lot of companies outside of games getting very excited by the term metaverse, or at least they're using it. Uh, I, I spoke with the music companies, film, tech, toys, sports, of course. Um, they're all building digital experiences or trying to and, and using the word metaverse to sort of describe it. But is, this, is that bit a positive or is there potential harm there as well? Oh, I, I mean, harm to the only harm would be to uh, to people who take their hard earned fiat currency and turn it into tokens. And then the tokens actually go down in value, not up in value. We've seen that happen in the last month. It does happen. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't, I don't think there's any any harm to be done. Look, I. I've been around long enough to remember, you know, Web 1.0, where every industrial company on earth, you know, said, we're actually a dot-com company. And they saw their valuations go up for a period of time until they didn't anymore. And then a lot of money was wasted. A lot of money uh, was speculated away. A lot of companies failed. But of course, there were some great successes that came out of that period as well, including a company now known as Meta, including mm -hmm. Google, including Amazon. So it would be an overstatement to say that nothing will succeed um, that's focused on building a new massive digital experience. Of course, I believe there will be numerous successes and hopefully we're, we're among a continuing uh, group of companies that will succeed. Um, that's certainly our goal, mm -hmm. but there will be failures as well. And just calling something, you know, meta, uh, a metaverse or a metaverse adjacent is no guarantee that value will be created. In the absence of creating value for the consumer, there's nothing there. Yeah. I guess for us in games, metaverse, or, or at least the journey that we've been on in, in this space, it doesn't, it's, uh, it, it doesn't feel that new to us because our games, you mentioned Grand Theft Auto Online, we could talk about um, some of your competitors as well. They, they've been on that. Well, let's go, games... let's go back much further. Let's talk about World of Warcraft, which has been around forever, yeah. or EverQuest before that. So this is, this is not new. Yeah. No, you know, great. And, and today, they're you know, what about Roblox? This is a massive, massive opportunity and uh, a massive digital experience that serves many millions of people. That that exists already. I, I, as I said, I'm just skeptical when people uh, launch something and collect other people's hard-earned cash um, in the promise of creating speculative gains. That that makes me nervous. Hmm. What do you think, and I suspect this is part of it, but what do you think are the key trends in the industry that have the most potential at the moment? Well, the trend that has the most potential, unfortunately, is an ancient one, which is creating new hits that are unexpected, that are spectacular, that excite people and engage people and, um, and brighten their day. That's what the entertainment business has always done well. Um, the companies that do that well are the ones that succeed. The ones that don't do it well are the ones that don't succeed. It's our job to do that well. Ultimately, that's pretty much what we focus on, making hits, bringing them to consumers and continuing to bring our existing hits to consumers and then adding new content, 
so that the experience gets better and better. So it's the it's the it's the old it's the old classic of make good games, basically. It's the only thing that matters yeah. in my business. Well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll mention a few sort of uh, at least technical topics that have come up. So it, it, it's cloud and AI and machine learning and data analytics and all these areas um, uh, that are going into making these games um, <clears throat> at the moment. How important is it that companies sh- are investing in these areas, do you think? Well, each one is different. So uh, AI and machine learning, that, that that's just, just a new phrase, set of phrases that relates to what the video game business has always done, which is, you know, it's, it's a programming business. We, we use algorithms and computer programming to create the entertainment that we bring to consumers. I, I think what people are talking about now is just more, more complex, more advanced computing power. And that allows us to do more exciting things and allows us to have consoles that provide a, a tool set um, uh, that is, that's better and, um, and richer and deeper and potentially means that a game couldn't be that much more interesting and exciting. So uh, new technology is, is a huge driver of what we are able to do, but it's that spark of human creativity when applied to that new technology that brings hits to the marketplace. Now we need to do both. We have to be as current as anyone else on new technology, but technology alone will not help us succeed. Um, uh, mightily, what helps us succeed mightily uh, would be the creative folks who work here. Um, we're most focused on the audience, so we, you know, technological elegance is fun and interesting to the experts who work here, but it's only relevant if it's used in service of making a great game. You mentioned cloud computing, and um, that's a completely different topic, and the m- use of uh, the cloud has primarily in our business has been uh, discussed in the context of streaming services. Now remember, streaming services are not business models, they're, they're distribution models. And they're potentially interesting distribution models because you can potentially get uh, one of our properties into the hands of a consumer without the intermediation of a, a dedicated device. Um, we supported Stadia. I think we were the first company to support Stadia. We still do. So we clearly believe in streaming, but we don't believe streaming is a game changer. We don't believe that streaming will be a different business. It will be the same business, um, and the same business requires us to make hits. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people uh, associate streaming with subscriptions, but you're quite right in that subscription is a business model um, that doesn't necessarily require streaming. It might be that the two go together. but um... Yes, it might be that they go together. Uh, but they certainly are, are not necessarily tied to each other. Mm. How, how have you, uh, this wasn't a question I was planning to ask, but how, how, have, um, how have you found, because you used to be skeptical about subscriptions. Um, I know that your position is, I'm not sure until I see it, but um, how, how have you been feeling about the sort of subscription model? Well, we, we've supported various subscription services and we're happy to do so. Our skepticism has been around making frontline console products available day and day with, um, with subscription. And that doesn't make any sense to us because economically speaking, we don't think consumers are prepared to pay for that. Why would they? And we can't afford to turn our business upside down in a way that doesn't make sense economically. So there always has to be an intersection between what the consumer wants and what the publisher is able to do. And, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to do that for frontline properties in our opinion. And I think Sony minimally agrees with us because they've said so. It can, can be potentially great for catalog properties. Those are properties that have been in the market for a while. If their price has been reduced. Um, it can make economic sense to offer those on a subscription basis. I think the bigger complication is not enough people are talking about what's right for the consumer. So I understand why linear entertainment subscriptions exist because people in this country consume, households consume 150 hours of linear programming a month. That's over 100 properties, by well over 100 properties. If you can have access to great content and fill that need for with two or three subscription services, and you can if you're willing to turn from one to the other, which is, of course, what's happening, that's a very good deal compared to buying a la carte or even compared to prior cable programming packages. But interactive entertainment is consumed 
at a different level, about 45 hours a month. And in a different way, it's perhaps two or three or four or five properties in a month. It's certainly not over 100 properties in a month. So it's not clear that your broad-based audience wants access to many hundreds of games in a month and is willing to pay for them. It's, it is possible that a small subset of the, the audience wants that, but I don't think it's a broad-based consumer offering because it's not how people tend to consume interactive entertainment now. No. No, By yeah. the way, I could be completely wrong about this, which is totally fine. This company does not operate based on one person's opinions, including mine. And when it makes sense, we support subscription services. And if that's where the consumer wants to be, that's where we'll be. It's one of the terrifying things about working in video games and that we're such on the on the cutting edge of everything that uh, uh, any prediction will automatically will never inevitably make you look someone look foolish. Um, in, um, I don't in know. You know, in my case, you stick around long enough, and the predictions end up mostly being true. So, but what's that? My as my wife reminds me, even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I, 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 I think there's a few, I've, I've spoken to a few people around the subscription model and that, that idea of um, the fact that people are, are putting so much, you know, service-based games like Grand Theft Auto Online, they're playing those games so much um, that for those customers, it perhaps doesn't make sense to subscribe to a service that gives you hundreds of games when you're only playing, happily playing in an ecosystem, what, one or two. Um, but we'll see, we'll find out in due course. Um, exactly. Well, let's let's get, let me conclude by asking a specific uh, question about Take Two because you've just completed a major transaction by adding uh, Zynga to the organisation. Congratulations! Um, and uh, you've been growing, great. great, and you've been growing significantly in mobile even before uh, uh, Zynga. So it's obviously a, a, a big move. But how should we think about your overall business going forward, given your historical success with console and PC games? Well, let's not overstate the case. Uh, we're a work in progress. We've just closed a big transaction. So now what we have ahead of us is plenty of hard work. And that's what's behind us too. I'm fond of saying arrogance is the enemy of continued success. We see ourselves as a, as a lean, ambitious company with a, a culture we're proud of, a culture of inclusion, and transparency, honesty, some diplomacy, uh, and kindness um, that is focused entirely on excellence, starting with creative excellence. Um, we believe we have now the best collection of owned intellectual property across both console and mobile interactive entertainment businesses. We're proud of that. We have a lot of hits in the marketplace. Uh, the Zynga Forever franchises, the T2 mobile games that continue to perform, and the massive hits that come from 2K and Rockstar and Private Division. So we're in a great place. Um, if you assume the Microsoft Activision deal closes, we're the number two pure play interactive entertainment company on earth. And um, so we're number two. That means we have to try harder and we intend to try harder. We feel really good about the future. Well, uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting time to be working in the video games industry. And it's not good to see Take Two. Uh, obviously, we've been, we've been doing these interviews for... Uh, I tried to think how long. Uh, <laughs> Longer uh, than either one of us cares to say. Yeah, <laughs> but and uh, and to to think about you know the questions from fifteen years ago was like you know are you are you more than Grand Theft Auto uh, to now is is quite stark really and it's um, and it's been a uh, uh, a great journey. Uh, well, thank you. Thanks. Well, well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, Strauss, uh, for joining us and sharing your insight into the games market right now. Uh, and good luck with all the things that you have coming up. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for having me again. That's it for our first GI Live online keynote. Over the next two days, we've got a number of talks and sessions featuring the likes of Valve, Xbox, Velen Studios, Warner Music, Yogscast, Kiro Capital, Zordix, Lego, and, and loads more. So knowing the names I can remember. So stay tuned to live.gamesindustry.biz to catch all the sessions. Thank you all for watching.